Hi everyone, my name is Bella Blanton and today we're going to be talking about enlightened absolutism. So if anyone's here, can you just um, drop a, an emoji in the chat for how, you, what, how you're feeling about enlightened absolutism? Or like maybe you can even like comment like where you're at in the course and I'll get back to that as soon as um, we get started here. So, um, Enlightened Absolutist is what this presentation is on. We're going to um, move into it. So, if you have the time, um, follow Facebook, follow Think Fivable on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We have a lot of like funny memes and like helpful, helpful content stuff. So, I highly recommend you do that. Okay, and I also recommend that um, you check out on Thursday, October thirty first. Stephen is hosting a session on new societal order during the 1700s and it's like the European family. So um, the college board likes family and like women prompts. So I would definitely check that out. Today we're going to be covering, um, this is the intro. So um, that's that. We're going to start out by defining like what enlightened absolutism is and like explaining it and like the context from which it arose. We're gonna move into the enlightened absolutists that you need to know for the test, which are Frederick the Great, Joseph the Second and Catherine the Great. And also their effects on Poland and then we'll do some takeaways to um, discuss the content. So before I move any further, I'm just going to check the chat to make sure no one has any questions or anything or see if anyone's checked in yet. Um, okay, so with that, we will get started. And I'll, I would invite you to use the link that's provided in the chat to just join me on the presentation so that you can follow it a little better if possible. And we'll get started here. Okay, so these are the enlightened. This, these are some of the enlightened absolutists that are added up there. That's Frederick the Great and Catherine the Great. And Catherine the Great's actually on my AP Euro textbook. I'm not sure if she's on yours, but anyhow. So the philosophes um, had a huge influence on enlightened absolutism. Philosophes and the physiocrats, which were French Enlightenment thinkers, um, did not want to limit the power of monarchs, and that's important to note because. They did not support democracy. Um, they support reform, but not democracy. And um, they wanted to liberate intellectual life. That was the major reform that they were trying to get enacted and justify current economic and political structures. And um, they actually weren't against like the political power of the absolute, like or aut autocratic like monarchs, because if they could most of the time manipulate it for their own purposes. Because as you'll see, there are actually like several philosophes that. Um, corresponded directly with these monarchs. Okay, so I think it's important also that we like establish a definition of what enlightened absolutism actually is. And that is um, monarchical government in which the central absolutist administration was strengthened and rationalized at the cost of other centers of power, such as the aristocracy, church, and the representative bodies that had existed since the Middle Ages. So notice that I've um, bolded, strengthened, and rationalized at the cost of other centers of power. Those are some of the trends you're going to see across um, the enlightened absolutists and the extent to which they um, managed to accomplish this is the point where you'll notice where they start to like deviate. So if you're like comparing and contrasting them per se, which we'll do as we go through here. So um, any questions? All right, looks like we're good. Okay, so. Austria, Prussia, and Russia um, intended to occupy major diplomatic and military roles. So each implemented policy in favor of economic and social integration, and rulers sought new revenue and political support, and they needed they did this because they needed to finance armies. Um, as there's a lot of warfare on the continent during the early 17th, 18th century. And um, that taught these countries that they needed to finance better armies and advance technologically. And they also, to help accomplish this, especially with strengthening the state, they talked to a lot of like philosophes that corresponded directly with them via letters. An example would be Voltaire. He corresponded with a lot of like enlightened absolutists, but most notably Catherine the Great. So, and this is just letting you know um, which, which area they're from. Frederick the Great's from Prussia, Joseph II's from Austria, and Catherine the Great's from Russia. And these maps up here, if you'll just take a look at those when you can, the first one at the top is Europe at the very beginning of the 1700s, before the rise of the enlightened absolutists. And the one down here is after the rise. So um, we're, we're going to talk about that, especially in regards to Poland. 
So to, to jump off, we'll start with Frederick the Great of Prussia. Um, so how about the relations with the nobility? So he professed his desire should always come second to those of the Prussian people. And continue, continuing the trend from um, his Hohenzollern predecessors, Frederick protected the nobility. And um, to, he also did, he did some changing. Like he did um, make it so that you had to qualify for the bureaucracy via merit versus like by birth alone, which has been the system for like forever. And in seven, by 1770, a Prussian civil service commission oversaw all appointments. To play a role in government, you had to do more than be just born into it. And that brings up an important question. Like why didn't Prussia experience conflict between the nobility and the monarchy that other states did? Um, that would be because Frederick protected the nobility and he created new nobles. So when you protect the nobility, that, that means um, you're allowing them to continue their power locally and allowing them to keep taxing like their subjects. And by creating new nobles, um, similar thing, you're giving them more, greater power and like um, legitimizing that. And that's how you make friends basically. So that's what he was doing. He also allowed university professors a good deal of freedom and allowed them to explore new ideas. And he did that. And the result of that was that university professors praised him and it gave him a greater reputation. And um, actually, interestingly enough, a lot of nobility trained alongside like the middle class, like nobles, clergy, and bureaucrats all came to like share a similar educational background. That background was comprised of enlightenment ideas, religious values, and loyalty to the state, especially loyalty to the state. Um, that's important because that helps out Frederick. So, in terms of religion, um, he protected foreign workers who brought important skills to Prussia. So Catholics and Jews could can settle and contribute to the economy of the Lutheran, of his Lutheran slash Protestant basically state. And um, that's pretty notable because Jews, obviously, as we've talked about throughout this course, are like, were seldom like tolerated. He didn't grant them equality per se, but he did allow them to settle and contribute. And that gave him like the support of some of the Philip. Philosoph philo philosophers, philosophers, including Kant and Mendelssohn. And Protestants were still given the best positions in government despite that. In terms of economic policy, um, there was a new codification of Prussian law. So that was a lot of different reforms, including the elimination of torture, the, late, the law system became more unified as opposed to like the regional, like localized law systems that had been in place before that. And that had the effect of diminishing the nobility's influence in this sector of the state. And it lowered the number of capital crimes. So by doing this, he guaranteed that his power was increased and that there's a more efficient system that worked out better. And um, 18th century warfare, we'll also talk about this in relation to law, it hurt Prussia economically. So Frederick sought to like enact policies that would fix his country's economy. They were like more interventionist as opposed to the previous policies which had been um less centralized so imported workers that was what we just talked about for a second ago um in terms of like the jews and the catholics and peasant migrations he allowed them to migrate between um, areas in his state to contribute to different economies and strengthen them and there's a land mortgage credit system was introduced and that involved raising money for agricultural improvements and as as food production Im improved and like in increased um, so did the prosperity of the state. So despite the reform, peasants were still hurt by Frederick's taxation. So why would he have this taxation? He wanted to maintain the support of the nobility. By allowing them to continue to tax the peasants, um, he he kept them in, his, in good graces and as friends. So that was very important for him to maintain his power, as you'll see when we contrast against Joseph II. So before I move on to the next um, enlightened absolutist, I'm going to check the chat and see if anyone has any questions. Be good so far? Okay. Feel free to add anything in there as we go and I'll check back in frequently. So, Joseph II of Austria. This picture up here um, is with his mother, Maria Theresa, who's also very important and we're actually gonna start with her. So, Austria was actually the most diverse of all of the European powers during this era. And during the War of Austrian Succession, Maria Theresa granted the aristocracy considerable independence and that kind of connects to the fact that Austria was diverse, when you have a lot of diverse people and you're encompassing them within the state, it's difficult to get them all to obey laws and um, support your authority. So um, to make sure that she remained actually a ruler and wasn't like disposed or anything, um, she granted the aristocracy in Hungary um, considerable independence. 
which um, Joseph II would later uh, diminish. And some of the other steps that she took to increase royal power are also important to Joseph II's rule. Um, tax collection was reformed. Everyone paid, including the nobles and the clergy. So back in like the Middle Ages, the nobles and the clergy never had to pay. So that was a very important like difference. And she also established councils to deal with government problems. That's playing into like the bureaucracy, increased access to local education, and allowed the bureaucracy to interfere in the affairs of nobles, limiting the amount of work that they could impose on the peasants, which was pretty fair of her and um, kind of distinct by the, for the period. So we're going to move into Joseph here. So his reforms were, by comparison, a lot more comprehensive. Territorial expansion into lands occupied by Poland, Bavaria, and the Ottoman Empire was among his greatest goals. And he also wanted to actually reduce the freedoms of the Hungarian nobility, which had been allowed by his mother. And he um, restructured the Hungarian government at the local level to increase his influence. So he's basically sending his people in on the local level and like requiring, for example, that they speak German instead of Hungarian in government matters. And that's um, important because then you're by switching the language, you're switching who's in control of the negotiations to an extent. So sorry, guys, let me add this in here real quick. All right. So church reform is also important. Maria Teresa, who was a Roman Catholic, did not allow the church to control the state, which is distinctive because the church traditionally played like a huge role in the state. And she was also opposed to religious toleration. So um, that was a, that's a huge difference between her and Joseph II. Joseph II, by comparison, was Roman Catholic as well. And he supported Rome, um, religious toleration. And by doing this, he extended freedom of worship to Lutherans, Calvinists, Orthodox Christians. They could, among other things, they could worship, participate in commerce, become involved in the public service, all important things. Um, he also wanted the church to submit directly to the state, and that's probably one of his most important reforms. Bishops could not establish direct communication with the papacy. So they had to go through him. So that's making him the middleman and making him, uh, give, granting him greater power over the church. And he actually dissolved over 600 monasteries, which is a lot. Some of the monasteries are still in place and they're still very pretty, but um, he dissolved them during this era. So he also changed the methods of training for the priests and Roman Catholic priests basically became royal workers. So they worked for him and not the Pope. And that's important because you see as through these steps, he's taking greater and greater control of the state. Um, this policy is called Josephinism, and the main thing it took away was any independence that the church had previously enjoyed was now pretty much um, eliminated or severely restricted. Okay, he also wanted to um, improve his country's economy, like the rest of the, the enlightened absolutists. Um, so to do that, he abolished internal tariffs and improved infrastructure. So the internal tariffs, by abolishing these, he was allowing for greater trade throughout his lands, and by allowing for greater trade, that's greater economic prosperity. And he also improved the infrastructure. So by improving infrastructure, that is like the roads that were there, um, river systems, he helped to establish lines of trade there. And he also restructured the legal code to prevent extensive noble influence. And he moderated the influence of the nobles over the peasantry. So he abolished serfdom. Peasants no longer need the Lord's permission to marry or participate in skilled work. And in 1789, he actually proclaimed that all landowners would be taxed. So um, he's in, he's kind of like, if you can see, he's kind of like encroaching on the nobles' privileges here. And that's not going to make them very happy because they traditionally had these. And when privileges start to get taken away from the nobles, they revolt. So they prevented this from becoming effective, actually. And peasants revolted under the landowners because they'd heard that they'd been granted these greater rights but um, they didn't have them because the landowners refused to enforce them. So they were actually so controversial that Joseph could never completely implement them. So they, um, his brother, Leopold, was actually forced to repeal many of them when he succeeded. So that's a marked contrast to um, Frederick the Great, who we just talked about, who made friends with the nobility. This guy was not making friends. So therefore, his reforms were not absolute and did not stay for long at all. Okay, so before we move on to Catherine the Great, um, I'm going to ask if you have any questions or if um, the content's making sense. We all good? Okay. All right, so Catherine the Great. 
That's her palace down below. You can still check it out in Russia. It's very pretty. She's actually originally from Germany. Um, she was a German princess, although it wasn't really Germany at the time, because um, Germany didn't become like a state until like the 19th century. But that's where she's from originally. So she was actually very pragmatic. She knew that reforms, reforms needed like a wide basis of support, like politically with the nobility and socially with like the majority of the people that she ruled. So while she reformed the Russian era, autocracy, um, she still pre preserved the government style largely and supported the rights and power of the nobility, which is important because um, she granted the nobles influence over government offices in their areas. And why would she support the no rights and power of the nobility? Well, she didn't really have much room to, um, to not support that because the nobility in Russia were extremely strong and the middle class was not as well developed as other sectors of Europe. So uh, she didn't really have a choice. So the Charter of the Nobility preserved their power. Um, she did this to ensure political support. And Russia did not have the means to provide an educated bureaucracy. The means um, lied in like the university system, um, the middle class that came about from like strong trade relations. So Russia didn't have the means to do all of that. So therefore, Catherine did not um, did not support the middle class at that expense. So economy. Catherine wanted to strengthen the economic reforms implemented by Peter the Great. If you'll remember, Peter the Great established his um, city of St. Petersburg on a warm water port. And that's huge for Russia because by establishing these warm water ports, they're gaining access to trade um, on the continent and in other areas around the world. She also sought to suppress internal barriers to trade. Those are like generally like tariffs and stuff like that. Exports increased, so the quality of Russia's production was going up. And it, she also allowed for Russia's small middle class to grow, which is interesting, but kind of predictable at the same time, because the small middle class was located in the cities, and they were the ones that were actually facilitating a lot of the commerce that Catherine was promoting. She also corresponded with the philosophes and balanced reform with conservatism. The nobles did not cede power, um, so she preserved serfdom, basically. But at the same time, she tried to expand the Russian state. She did this by strengthening diplomacy with nearby areas, and Russia continued to pursue those warm water ports at all costs. In 1769, um, due to Russian involvement and um, provoking, um, the Ottomans actually declared war on Catherine's Russia. So by 1770, uh, Russia settled um, their fleet all the way down to the eastern Mediterranean, where they won several victories against the Ottomans. And the treaty of, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, it's a long one, but it's right there. So it resulted in the Ottoman Empire giving Russia an outlet on the Black Sea. So the outlet on the Black Sea, another warm water port. And there was also more free navigation, which is important. So the Crimeans, they got independence until Catherine annexed them, of course. And Catherine became a protector of Eastern Orthodox Christians. So both of these things here are actually controversial. This, um, the annexation of Crimea is actually something that's like still a problem today in like that area because Crimea has been changing hands for a while. Um, there's actually a crisis between like Russia and Ukraine back in like, I don't know, like 2013, 2014 around that. And then Catherine becoming a protector of Eastern Orthodox Christians was also an issue because France had been told that they were the protector of, um, of Roman Catholics. So that's setting up for controversy there. These are some of the pictures from um, the war, which was kind of brutal. But, okay, so this is extremely important, the partition of Poland. Um, actually so important that I'm going to blow up these maps really quickly here. So you can see the contrast. The first one's a little blurry, but this one's a lot better. Okay. So if you'll see here, this is the difference. This is Europe um, before the partition, and this is Europe after the partici partition, which granted um, Joseph, Frederick, and Catherine a lot of new things and a lot of power, a lot of extra territory. Territory and more people means more tax money, more crops for exports, etc. So this is what happened here, and I'm going to explain in a second how it happened. So... Move that there, move this here. Okay, so Russia's success in warfare gave her, who's Catherine, the support of the people. So in light, other enlightened despots, uh, despots, which are another like term for the um, enlightened absolutists, 
actually feared her increased power. So Frederick the Great proposed a partition of Poland, which he did this because Catherine had won victories in Danubian territory, which is like starting to head towards his area. So he was not happy about that. He did not want her to like invade his territory. So Russia um, would leave its freshly conquered Danubian territory. Under the partition, each state additionally receives territory. So you'll see that Russia got a considerable section of territory with 2 million people. That's over here. Sorry, over here. Um, Prussia got most of East Poland, um, which had about around the same amount of residents. And Austria got South Poland, which is 2.5 million inhabitants plus salt mines. So that's nice. So why couldn't Poland stop the invasion? That's a really important um, question to ask in European history. So they had no central government. Um, Poland was controlled by a lot of like smaller scale nobles that basically sat in their castles and because they were fortified and because it would be too tedious to unify them all, they, um, they remained um, lords over their own land at the expense of a strong central state. So they actually tried after this partition to centralize, but it couldn't, it wouldn't work because it was, it was just too late. These powers had already come in and established a presence there. So this partition gives us a very important takeaway for European history in this time. And that is that states without strong bureaucracies, armies, and monarchies could not attempt to influence continental politics. All of these um, enlightened despots slash absolutists had um, strengthened their states. They had stronger armies, more finances because they had increased their trade. They had the support of the people in the most case with the exception of Joseph. And by doing this, they'd established themselves so firmly that any other rising power would have been a threat and would have been immediately eliminated. So they could not influence continental politics at all at this point. So, and believe it or not, Poland was actually partitioned a couple more times. And that's why it's kind of like a joke. You might see like memes about Poland. That's why, because they were like continuously like partitioned. They, it, not even that long after this, I think like a little over a decade later got partitioned again. So, all right. So before we do takeaways, because you guys are going to help me do these takeaways, um, I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions or if there's any more content that you're not sure on. Okay, looks like we're good. All right, so takeaways. We're going to do these together. So I'll check back in the chat, and if you guys have at any point, um, some ideas for takeaways, I'd be happy to hear them. And we do these together so that you can understand by teaching yourself to go back through the content, what are the important things that you should take into the AP Euro exam when you take it in May? So one second, let me just change the coloring of this. Okay. All right, so Frederick the Great, I did the first one. So he created a strong Prussian state that relied on the fidelity slash loyalty or whatever of the military, nobility, Lutheran clergy, and middle-class bureaucracy. He permitted extensive religious toleration and called himself the first servant of the state, which is that whole thing where he's saying that his needs come second to Prussia's needs. So that's important. Okay, so we're going to move on here to um, Joseph II. Okay, um, so what do you guys think are the major ideas slash takeaways that we can get from Joseph II's rule? Do we have any? I'll give you like a minute or so. Okay. Doesn't look like it. All right. So Joseph II, we're going to go back up to these slides and look through them together. As you can see, he had his, his the, the reforms and like authority and like privileges granted by his mother influenced his reign a lot. So we'll take that into consideration. Okay. But here's a good comparison note. Joseph's reforms were more comprehensive than Maria Theresa's. So we'll write that. So his reforms were comprehensive reforms. We also want to note that he took away the privileges of the Hungarian nobility, which is um, something that was a contrast to his mother, who had to grant them the privileges in order to keep the Austrian state, which was diverse in both land holdings and in territory. So it took away Hungarian nobles is privileges. All right, so that's important. Going back through. 
Okay, let's see where is he at. Okay, so church reform. Ah, oh, there's another good one. He wanted the church to submit to the state. So we're going to want to keep the key term Josephinism in mind, and it took away the independence of the religion, of Roman Catholicism as a religion. So independence of church abolished is all let's raise that. And we're going to talk about contrast here in a second. So how was Frederick the Great and Joseph the Second different in their success? And that note is going to come in when we talk about the nobility. So because his economic changes came at the expense of the nobility, he was not successful. The nobility would not take that. And that was also due to the fact that Austria Hungary was like a very like diverse territory at this time. So um, reforms were not all successful. So that's what we were just talking about there. Nobility. The nobility throughout European history never liked getting their privileges taken away. They would always pull out these like ancient doctrines from like the Middle Ages saying, well, you gave me this privilege, so you can't take it now. And then we're going to talk really quick about Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great's reforms, also very important. Also interesting that she's a strong like female ruler during this period, as was Maria Theresa. So as you'll see here, the Charter of the Nobility this is preserving the power of the nobles. So she sought to preserve the power of the nobles. So we'll note that. Um, all right. So why does anyone remember why Catherine the Great would maintain this noble power? Now I'm going to check the chat for this and see if anyone's around. Do you remember um, why Catherine would seek to maintain the power of the nobility? Give you a minute here. If you don't, that's okay, and we'll just go back to it. Okay, we'll just go back. Okay, right. so Catherine the Great would maintain this noble power because she didn't really have a choice. Russia had a very strong nobility and a very strong autocratic tradition. They did not have a strong middle class because there was not an established like university system to support that. There also wasn't um wasn't like the the burgeoning like trade that you would have elsewhere, like in lands that were more central to the continent and had like more connections. So she sought to maintain noble power because of a lack of bureaucratic staffing. And that is the lack of like the universe, like the educated middle class that is so central to the staffing of bureaucracy. At the same time, Catherine also couldn't afford to finance a whole new like bureaucratic, like nobles of the robe slash um, nobility that were like established by her and um or like bought by her through like privileges and stuff like that and she also couldn't like afford to like pay for like an entire like state army so because of that um she had to maintain noble power and that is in the charter of the nobility which is granted here um see economy oh yeah so she suppressed internal barriers to trade Corresponding with Philosophs, like I said earlier, most notably Voltaire, and she preserved the serfdom. But at the same time, we have to note especially that she wanted to continue the reforms of Peter the Great. So that's important. So continue the reforms of Peter the Great. All right, so going on off of that, how would she do that? Well, she would have to basically make war because no one's going to grant this territory freely. So she sought a warm water port that was within Ottoman territory and she got one on the Black Sea. She won it from the Ottoman Empire and that's where Crimea comes back in again and she's granted like protector of like the Eastern Orthodox Christians. Basically her influence is strengthened in the Ottoman territories. So we want to note that she got another warm water port on the Black Sea. That's important because that'll help her trade um, in Eastern lands, which are have historically been very lucrative in terms of financial gain. Okay, let's see here. I think that's about it for Catherine. Okay, so this is a very important takeaway you should get from this. The partition of Poland is like the first partition of it anyways. So, um, her success in war against the Ottomans was what gave her the, the, the um, support of the people and the corresponding fear of the other enlightened absolutists, um, Frederick, Joseph, all those guys. 
um, did not like this because she was getting close to their lands by expanding that way. So um, she, the other enlightened autocrats feared her. So I'll just label this the partition of Poland because the partition of Poland became about largely because of that. So partition of Poland. All right, so first off, we need to know what they gained. And they gained a lot of territory, a lot of people, salt mines, and it came at the expense of, Austri um, of Polish nobles. So I'm going to put that down. The expense of Polish nobles because they were not centralized. That's important. Centralized states in Europe, um, for the most part, have greater success. And that's kind of obvious because when you have a central power, um, they're able to delegate responsibilities better. They have increased finances so they can pay for a better army. It's not regionalized. There's no internal strife to deal with as much. So Polish nobles um, lost territory. And I'll just put centralization in parentheses because they tried and failed to centralize after this. Did not work. All right. So. And then we have our major conclusion there, which is bolded. So it's. I'll leave that there. You don't need to put that on the end. So uh, we're going to talk for a second. Like, how would you compare and contrast these monarchs if you were looking at them? I'll check the chat for that. So I'll give you like a minute um, if you're there to let me know. How would you like compare and contrast them? Will I fix this? Okay. All right. So. To compare and contrast them, that would be how successful were they is a question you'll need to ask. I'll just make it under questions category for you to reflect on later. Success is a question. How successful were they? Why weren't they successful? And if you look at the role the nobility plays, you'll note that um, a lot of the success had to do with whether or not the reforms were popular with the people that they implemented them over, especially the nobles, because they were the people that had the most power to do something about it, because obviously they had these fortified castles, armies, lots of money. So success is a question you need to ask. And then at the same time, what about um, individual challenges? If you'll know, um, if you have a state that does not have like a unified people, a unified culture, it's going to be a lot harder for you to implement reform because they're just going to disagree. Um, that's the case here with Austria-Hungary. And this is going to also, if you'll know, later be the case down the road when we get to World War I and um, the, the Balkans went off because they did not like having another culture have power and control over them. So individual challenges is another question you should ask. And then the extent to which they were successful. So... This um, session was, we, as we talked about, it was talked about as iron ruling wrapped in a cotton fist. So what does that mean? That means that these, ref these reformers, not the reformers, these rulers were extremely, um, they were influenced by enlightenment philosophies, but at the same time, the reforms were extremely, like, occasionally harsh. They were still extremely absolutist. So... They weren't like ceding to democracy. That's another important point. The philosophes, enlightenment, while the ideas later influenced democracies like America's, they were not democracy in itself. The philosophes like Voltaire, Kant, those guys, they did not support democracy. They actually supported the monarchs, but what they wanted was greater intellectual liberation. So that's an important takeaway as well, but I'll leave that for you guys to think about. And it was also covered beforehand, so... Anyhow, I'm going to check and see if there's any more questions, and I'll remind you guys that um, there's another stream tomorrow on the new societal order, which is the 1700s European family. That's important because social stuff comes up a lot in AP Euro, so let's see if we have any questions here. All right. It's looking like we don't have any questions, so with that, I'll end the stream. Thank you guys for coming tonight, and I hope you learned something about enlightened absolutism. Feel free to send any questions via um, the chat feature on our webpage and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you for coming and have a great night.